remote. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be back in the Bay Area. I haven't been here for a while. Um, I'm always surprised at how nice people are in Northern California. I've only been here for a couple of hours, and already I've had some terrific experiences with people being kinder than they really even needed to be uh, towards me and my daughter. So if you look at me as I stand before you, you see my red eyes, perhaps my trembling hands, my staggering walk. It's not that I have succumbed to some rare tropical disease, but that I am suffering from a very severe case of jet lag. <laughs> the older you get, the worse it gets. And jet lag does have an advantage, and the advantage is you don't sleep at night. Uh, so I drove from Los Angeles to uh, here, got lost, ended up north of Stockton, had to come back uh, during the night. So basically, I've had no sleep. And I'm not boasting about it. <laughs> I know people at Harbor do. But, uh, well, you know, they work all night, and they saunter in in the morning and say, yeah, that was such an easy project. <laughs> so I have been studying wild orangutans now for 45 years. The reasons why I study them are somewhat complex. But basically, I think it began when I was a small child. I grew up in Toronto many, many years ago. And in those days, it was possible to lie in your backyard and look up at the stars, sort of a vast expanse of sky that was black sky that was filled with stars. Now we have vision pollution, what would it be called? We have noise pollution, but we also have uh, visual pollution. So I know that my children uh, were not able to do this. But I was able to do this. And as a small child, I would look up at the stars, and I would ask those questions that people have been asking since time immemorial. And that is, who are we? Why are we here? Where are we going? And what is the meaning of all this? <laughs> And for whatever reason, my search for those answers uh, came in a funny kind of combination that involved orangutans and forests. So I have been studying orangutans not just because I think knowledge for knowledge's sake is important, but I also think if we want to understand ourselves, it behooves us to understand our closest living relatives in the animal kingdom. And it behooves us to understand the environment and environments and ecologies from which they and ultimately us arose. So am I doing something right here? Green button? Oh, great. So, those questions. Who are we? Where did we come from? Well, scientists and philosophers and spiritual people, religious leaders, religious prophets have asked those questions. But we actually know very little about ourselves. And it's only been in the last few years that science has begun to give us the answers. Uh, when I was a graduate student many, many years ago at UCLA, half a century ago, actually, <laughs> um, the number of fossil hominin or hominin bones that was available would probably all fit on two of those round tables. That's how few there were. Uh, we did not even know, uh, when I was a graduate student, or we were just beginning to know who our closest living relatives were. We really didn't have an idea. And of course, genetics has advanced, and biochemistry has advanced tremendously uh, 
molecular biology has advanced tremendously since that time. So, 50 years ago, we also didn't understand the behavior of our closest living relatives. I think Jane Goodall had just, um, 50 years ago, maybe 60 years ago, in 1960, she went out and started studying chimpanzees. So we had a very tiny basis of knowledge to understand ourselves. And now that basis is growing, and we are beginning to get an idea of who we are. Because with no, without knowing where we came from, we cannot understand where we are going. So who are we? Who are our relatives? Well, our closest living relatives in the animal kingdom are the apes. And the apes consist of two groups, the small apes, which are known as gibbons and siamangs, and the great apes. And the small apes are also known as lesser apes because they are smaller by a factor of 10 than the great apes. And the small apes, gibbons and siamangs, are very interesting because they tend to be almost entirely monogamous and faithful to their mates. But yet they're very, very different from us, and genetically and behaviorally, uh, they're quite uh, distant. But yet, if you compare them to monkeys, who are also our relatives, all life is our relative. <laughs> I mean, even a banana is about 50% related genetically to us. It's a joke, but not entirely a joke. Uh, it's, it's shocking how much um, genetic material we share with every uh, being on this planet that is alive. So, gibbons are very different. When you look at them, you get an eerie feeling that they are us, but yet they're not us. They're like a shadow. I guess I have to hold this up. The great apes, as a group, are our closest living relatives in the animal kingdom. And there are two varieties. There's the African great apes and the Asian great ape. Great apes, uh, because they're uh, Asian great apes because there are two recognized species. I'm a slow learner. <laughs> it's taken me a few slides to realize I have to point this remote at the screen. So who are the African apes? Well, the African apes are so close to us that they have been called sibling species. They share about 97% percent to 98.4 percent genetic material with us. And often that 98.4 percent genetic material is upgraded to 99 percent, just to make it more emphatic. And the African great apes consist of gorillas, chimpanzees, and bonobos. This is who we are. So we'll start with gorillas. Gorillas are intensely social. It's very rare that you will find, it happens, you'll find solitary, uh, often black backs or who are not fully mature, or silver backs who are fully mature, um, as solitary individuals in the wild, it happens. But most of the time, gorillas live in groups that have been called harem groups, and people don't like the term, but it's, it is what it is, right? <laughs> and so these groups consist usually of one silverback male, who is the father uh, of the infants that have been born to the females in the group. And the interesting thing about gorillas is that a male and a female in the wild does not form a stable group. Females, if they're the only one in a group with an adult male, will leave him. It's almost like they're saying, well, you can't uh, attract other females, so you can't be that great a male. So 
uh, invariably you have either solitary males or silverback males with um, a number of females in their group. The intensity of the sociality of gorillas is such that a female gorilla is by herself for the most period of time in her lifetime, maybe half an hour. And that's when she moves from one male's group to another. Otherwise, she's always with other gorillas. Not that she necessarily likes them, because her bonding is with the male. It isn't with uh, the other females in the group that he attracts from other groups, a variety of groups. And if you look at gorillas, they are probably the most sexually dimorphic of all primates. A male gorilla, a silverback, is, can be twice or three times as large as um, a female. And males are very competitive with each other, aggressive with each other, and, but not so much that sometimes a silverback male will allow another male another silverback male, to um, join his group, but not mate with his females. And sometimes the father will allow um, a blackback son to stay in the group, especially if the father is older. So what do we have with the gorillas? We have intense sociality. We have very strong uh, male competitiveness and male aggression. I mean, we all are aware of the King Kong image of gorillas, where he stands up and beats his chest and roars. And of course that's true, but also, uh, despite this competitiveness, male gorillas make excellent fathers, which is the reason that the late Diane Fossey, who was my, what should I call her, co-sister in uh, studying great apes, loved the big male gorillas so much. What attracted her to them was the compassion and the pity, and the kindness, and the kinds of relationships that, sh that these males had with their offspring. To the point where it was a silverback male who would adopt an infant if the mother died, or sometimes a juvenile if the mother uh, left the group. And when she left the group, she often would leave her juvenile uh, offspring behind. So if we try to characterize the relationships of gorillas. It's about intensity of sociality, extreme aggression among the males, and a kind of indifference among the females who are not related to each other, but who may find themselves in the same group. Ah, chimpanzees. Our closest living relative. 98.4% genetic identity with us. So close that blood, once blood groups are matched, uh, humans can receive chimpanzee blood and chimpanzees can receive uh, human blood. In fact, there are a few people walking this planet who have chimpanzee blood in their veins. And I've often thought because these blood transfers are often done uh, to wash uh, people's blood from traces of drugs. So there are some countries like Canada and Japan which scrutinize rock and rollers uh, for drug use before they are allowed to come in and play. So I've often thought that Keith Richards must have chimpanzee blood in his veins because he often gets his blood washed before he goes on tours. So what are, what are chimpanzees like? Well, again, chimpanzees are intensely social. Chimpanzees live in groups of related males who hold a territory in common and who defend it in common against neighboring communities of chimpanzees. Um, females, like gorilla females, are not particularly bonded to each other uh, and there has been some discussion and controversy as to exactly what relationship an individual female might have with a community of territorial males. Chimpanzees, like gorillas, intensely social. 
And they go one step further, though. They kill each other. Gorillas generally don't. In male-male competition, because the competition is usually one gorilla fighting another gorilla, so they're solitary fighters usually. Rarely do you see two gorillas um, ganging up on another silverback. Virtually never happens. But with chimpanzees, it's the usual kind of Mexicans, what they call Mexican standoff. If two groups of male uh, chimpanzees meet and they're equal in size, they'll scream at each other, vocalize, and then part ways. But if a group of patrolling males meet somebody else from a neighboring community, it's often the case that they will gang up on that lone member of the neighboring community and beat him up so badly, in some cases females as well, but more rarely, beat him up so badly that he dies or disappears. So chimpanzees, intensely social, also commit infanticide, and they also commit something that we would call genocide. So one of the things that Jane Goodall explicated in her multi-year study of wild chimpanzees at what was initially Gombe uh, Wildlife Reserve, now Gombe National Park, is she documented a group of gorillas, a group of gorillas, a group of chimpanzees, and that was the Casaquila community, that obliterated, killed every single adult male and adolescent male in another community called the Kahama community. If that's not genocide, I don't know what genocide is. And they took over their territory, and they also took over some of their females. The other interesting thing about chimpanzees is it's an extremely male-dominated society. Less so sometimes in captivity. It varies among regions. But in Jane Goodall's study group, the lowest ranking male adult male, is higher, is dominant over the highest ranking female. And when an adolescent male begins his climb to adult status, he starts by fighting and defeating the adult females. And once he climbs the, ad the dominant ladder of the adult females, then he starts with the lowest ranking male. And then we have bonobos. Bonobos have not been that intensely studied, but they have a reputation for being peaceful apes. But they also have a reputation for being extremely social, even more social than chimpanzees and gorillas, perhaps. And they live in large communities. They're not particularly territorial. They're not particularly warlike. Um, and they are different from both gorillas and chimpanzees with their stringent male hierarchies because it's bonobo females who dominate. And how do bonobo females dominate? I mean, male bonobos are slightly larger than female bonobos. Uh, male bonobos stay in their natal communities. It's females who come into uh, the male communities. So how do bonobos do it? Well, I think you probably all know the answer. <laughs> The answer is sex, because bonobo females are willing to have sex whatever, with whoever, and the most common form of sexual activity among bonobos is between two adult females, and second, between two adult males, and only third, between adult males and adult females. The other way that bonobo, so the, the reason it works is that if a bonobo male can have sex with whoever he wants at any time, why should he expend energy to join a gang? No, why should he, should he expend energy to um, maintain alliances with other males? So who does he maintain an alliance with? Well, who's the primary person in anybody's life, usually? Not always, usually. Mother, good old mother. So male bonobos maintain alliance with their mother. And when 
A mother dies, an adult female dies. The status of her adult son goes down. So why, oh, there's the other, and then the other reason is that I've spoken to bonobo researchers. I've spoken to bonobo conservationists. And what they talk about is the sacred trust among females. Under no circumstances will a female bonobo attack another bonobo. And this sacred trust extends so far as is illustrated in a story in a in, in an incident that happened in uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo where uh, a group of bonobos were released into the wild and they were a group. They'd been living together for many years. And they followed, I think it was like six weeks, by five African rangers who were taking notes and observing their adaptation to the wild. Well, with bonobos, what happens? A senior female gives the signal, nobody knows why, and then these so-called peaceful apes will attack with the same kind of fury that chimpanzees exhibit. So those bonobos, and there were over a dozen of them, attacked the rangers. They ripped off the faces of three of the rangers. They bit off the the forehead, they bit off the ears, they bit off the nose, they bit off the lips, they bit off the chin. And in fact, two of those rangers were sent to France. Now, don't ask me exactly why to France, uh, for facial restoration. And uh, they came back uh, to the Congo about two years later. And actually, that had a kind of a palliative effect because the local people really appreciated the fact that the researchers, who happened to be Belgian, uh, would go to such lengths to restore the faces. But getting back to the story, they attacked three of the five rangers. Why? Why only three? Well, because two of them were female. They didn't even touch the females. They didn't even look at them as they ripped the faces off the chimpanzees. So the question here is, why? Why are bonobos so different from chimpanzees? And what is the answer? What is the answer? It's a very obvious answer. I mean, what did uh, Bill Clinton say when he ran for president? He said, it's the economy, stupid, right? So chimpanzees and bonobos and gorillas don't have economies, but they have ecologies. And the difference is chimpanzees and gorillas live difficult lives with food scarcity. But bonobos live in paradise. And the reason they live in paradise, to a certain extent, I mean, no place on this earth is really paradise. You know, you still have microbes, you still have viruses, you still have, you know, seasons where the fruit doesn't fruit. But it's a paradise because in other places, gorillas and chimpanzees uh, cohabit the same environment, the same places. And you see an ecological separation between them, uh, especially in dire seasons when there's less food. They don't compete as intensely with each other. They kind of move away in terms of... But where bonobos live, for whatever reason, a million years ago, or maybe two, nobody knows. Archaeologists haven't caught up with this yet. Gorillas disappeared. So bonobos not only have the food that they eat as chimpanzees, because they are a type of chimpanzee, no matter what, so, no matter what anybody says, um, but also the food that the gorillas left behind, but is not being eaten. So <coughs> bonobos tend to be more herbarious, actually, than chimpanzees. <coughs> they also tend not to be uh, as extensive tool users. They tend to be They tend to be very, very smart and very sensitive. And what allows that in their situation is the unique circumstances because it's not well known either. The gorilla fact is relatively well known, but it's not well known that somebody else is missing from bonobo 
habitat, bonobo ecology, and that is baboons. In most places where bonobos live, there are no baboons. So they're probably also eating the food that the baboons left behind. So if we look at this list, and this is just um, an informal list. You know, we could make a different list. If we look at the African apes, what do we find? Intense sociality, intense gregariousness, strong hierarchical relationships, strong male dominance among girls and chimpanzees, strong female dominance among bonobos, but still hierarchies. Generalized intelligence, uh, there's evidence to prove that our that chimpanzee and great ape and human intelligence didn't really evolve for specific tasks or function, but basically evolved as a general overall problem-solving ability. They make, use, they make uh, tools and they use tools. They're long-lived. They're emotionally vulnerable, but they also have, um, they also exhibit extreme aggression and uh, they also kill other chimpanzees. At least chimpanzees do. The gorillas do uh, commit infant infanticide, and sometimes in the fight between two males, one male will suffer so much that he dies. But really, who are we describing? We say intense sociality, intense gregariousness, strong hierarchical relationships. Humans, right? I mean, people say that the worst thing you can do to a human being is put him or her in solitary. People go mad. So, what is the conclusion? So, in a sense, we are also African great apes. And, in fact, what initially caused our ancestors to diverge from the ancestors of the great apes, the African great apes. It's not our brains, because that was the latest development in our evolution, but our feet and our hips. We became bipedal. They did not. So that brings me to the animal that I study, orangutans. And I have been studying them for 45 years. And we know a lot more now than we did when I first went into the field. When I first went into the field 45 years ago, nobody knew for sure what orangutans ate. Some of them thought they were folivorous. They ate leaves. That was their primary food. Nobody really knew or understood the relationship between male and female orangutans. I mean, people thought they had to be social because they're great apes. Of course they have to be social. They have to be gregarious. Nobody knew these things. Now we know a lot. A lot more than we did then, that's for sure. So in many ways, orangutans are just like us. But in other ways, they're very, very different. And they're very, very different from the African apes and the small apes, gibbons and siamangs. Well, how are all the apes related? Well, they all seem to be fruit eaters. Even the gorilla, which in the, Ma in the Virunga volcanoes eats mainly herbaceous material. When you study gorillas in the lowlands of West Africa, uh, their diet incorporates a large component of mature fruit, just like chimpanzees, just like bonobos, just like orangutans. So, how are orangutans similar? Well, they have similar emotions. They're emotionally vulnerable. They have very strong mother-offspring bonds. An orangutan infant will stay with his or her mother for as many, of course, by this time he's no longer, or she's no longer an infant, for 10 or 11 years. So orangutans have the longest birth interval of any animal, any mammal on this planet. 
you know, because that's one of the reasons they're so vulnerable to, uh, to extinction. And this is one of the things that I documented. Because in order to establish that a birth interval is seven or eight years, you have to be there a while. I mean, you, have to have, you have to be there for at least several birth intervals. So you have to be there at least 20, 25 years to document on average what the birth interval is. And orangutans also have a generalized intelligence. Um, they have a dependence on the forest and nature for well-being that is very obvious because they're arboreal. It just hits you in the face with orangutans. They live in the trees. They move in the trees. They make nests and sleep in the trees. They find virtually all their food, maybe 95% of it in the trees. So it's very obvious that they are dependent on the forest. How are they different? Well, they're really kind of strange. You think about it. They're solitary or semi-solitary. They're not gregarious at all. They're boreal. And then the adult males develop these flanges. And if you haven't really spent any time with orangutan males or seen them, they look bizarre. They look like creatures from another planet. They have these huge flanges that outline the face. And the other thing about adult male orangutans, which again, I was fortunate enough to be able to document, is that they are totally intolerant <coughs> of other adult males. They cannot so much stand the sight of one another. If two adult males come together, and they virtually never do except in the presence of a female who wants to mate, in other words, an estrus or a receptive or proceptive female, almost invariably, one will run away, and the other one usually doesn't bother chasing him. So one of the only ways that you can show submission to an orangutan is by running away. And if you can't run away, you're in trouble, because they just think you're obstinate, right? So, but they're very smart. And they have complex social networks, just like the other great apes do, except these complex social networks are invisible. They're invisible to the naked eye, but they're there. And how do we know they're there? We know, first of all, from interactions with humans, that a orangutan will recognize somebody that they met 10, 20 years ago. I mean, sometimes it's shocking. I'll give you an incident that happened. It's not a pleasant incident, but it happened recently. And we had a construction volunteer, just like Victoria. <laughs> and I, did, I do want to thank you for arranging this talk. Uh, it's been very pleasant. Um, and four years ago, uh, she went to the care center where we have, um, where we are preparing orangutans, we're rehabilitating them for release into the wild, and an orangutan bit the tip of her finger off. Right? Four years later, four years later, uh, the same person comes back, and this time the orangutan attacks her, knocks her to the ground, and does damage to her, her calves and her thigh. And that's the other thing about orangutans. If you want to get into a fight with a great ape, get into a fight with an orangutan. Because they go for the fingers and the toes. They don't go for the face like chimpanzees and bonobos do. I don't know about gorillas. Uh, you virtually never hear of attacks on human beings by gorillas. Um, <clears throat> there's something about gorillas that they seem like the most emotionally, I use that phrase, before, emotionally vulnerable of all the great apes despite their, despite their large size. Anyways, <clears throat> you don't want to get into a fight with any great ape because they're much stronger than a human being. So what is my point here about orangutans? Well, my point here is that 
Orangutans have relationships, social relationships, but these relationships are not visible to the human eye. And the only way that you can see them is actually by documenting them. And, and maybe somebody actually suggested to me, on Twitter no less, that, uh, which is the only form of social media that I use, except somebody persuaded me to start posting photographs on Instagram, um, that <clears throat> I should actually plot these relationships and, in, you know, in, in sort of graphic form to understand them better. Um, these relationships do exist, but they're in the mind. You don't see them because orangutans don't meet each other. It's, it's like the orangutan <clears throat> who had not met this woman for four years, right? But yet four years later, was it an accident that she was attacked? That orangutan raced by me. I was standing there right here, and she just raced by me, practically brushing me in order to get at this individual, and maybe another individual too. So these networks exist. But the main <clears throat> relationship and connection that orangutans have is with the forest. And orangutan infants are just as curious, well, so as cute as <clears throat> human children. I think all, all infants, no matter what species, uh, have evolved to be cute. <laughs> it's just the way it is, right? Uh, so that their parents will love them and take care of them in a meaningful fashion and not abandon them, not wean them too early. Another wild boy next captive. So, what are the problems that orangutans face? So, like I said, I'm repeating myself here, I've been studying them for 45 years. And it's like in terms of their existence as wild populations on the planet, they, um, it's two steps forward, one step back, one step forward, two steps back. It just it, it just has no, um, no conclusion. So orangutans face deforestation, and the main actor for deforestation now uh, is the establishment of palm oil plantations. Uh, orangutans face illegal logging, legal mining, and poaching. So deforestation and habitat loss not only due to palm oil plantations and <clears throat> pulp and timber estates, but just establishment of roads, uh, people making gardens, establishment of towns and villages. Um, <clears throat> there's a multitude of causes that end up destroying the forests of Borneo. So the deforestation and habitat loss in Borneo uh, is illustrated by this map of Borneo. And you can see what we have. Oh, sorry. Let's go back. Can I go back? Oh, good. Okay, so 1950, over 90% of Borneo was forested. Look at 2010. And where are we? We are right here, Tanjung Puting National Park, 400,000 square, 400,000 hectares of forest. And what is predicted for 2020? And it's coming. This is what the forest will look like. And Tanjung Puting will still hang on, but just barely, 400,000 hectares. So now it's down to about 300. And the reason the forests exist here is because this is the mountainous spine of Borneo. This is where it's very difficult to access the forest. Uh, it's very rugged. Um, it's a place where explorers and naturalists in the 19th century found that they could only travel one mile a day. And I agree. <laughs> because I was in the mountains just a few weeks ago. 
not even, not even here, but sort of here. Sorry, here. Still forest here. And I was very proud. Two kilometers. Two kilometers there, two kilometers back. And it was like this. So that's the only reason the forest will remain here, this mountainous spine. And orangutans, well, orangutans live and fall with the forest. So um, in 1950, there were probably 800,000 orangutans in Borneo, maybe more. Now, 40,000, as Victoria said, 40,000 maybe. And palm oil, legal logging. I took the shot. And Indonesians are such polite, gracious people. These are legal loggers. And I came across them in the middle of the national park. This was a few years ago. And they were pulling out this log on the track. And they used soap, just like skateboarders use soap, you know, to grease their skateboards, the wheels. Well, the loggers use soap to uh, grease the rails here so the logs move <clears throat> more easily. So they're pulling out this log. It's 100% illegal. It's in the middle of a national park. And I wasn't quick enough with my camera. So I asked them politely if they wouldn't mind moving the log back and then moving it forward, and they did. <laughs> Sometimes I think Indonesians are the most polite, gracious people in the world. <laughs> And they didn't even mind being documented. Now, increasingly, people are becoming more sophisticated. And now they don't want the, their criminal deeds documented. But this picture was taken maybe t over 10 years ago. They didn't care. They really don't mind <clears throat> you photographing them. And it tells you something about the Indonesian soul and the relationship that they have with the world and with other people. Because when I was in Africa, people did object. And apparently there's a belief that if you take their picture, you capture their soul. Well, with Indonesians, they thank you when they take, you take their picture because they say that what you're doing is you are taking their image to the rest of the world. You're freeing that image, in a sense. So anyways, a little aside, but interesting. That picture brings back memories. And in addition to what I just said, it also brings back terrible memories of how much damage illegal loggers uh, did to the forests of Tanjung Puting. Fortunately, we were able to keep them out of our 50 square kilometer study area. But the rest of the park, much of it was ravaged. <clears throat> and one of the things that our foundation does, it does a lot of things. You know, we're a small foundation, is we do buy forest uh, as much as we can. It's very difficult to buy forest in Indonesia because all certificates and land documents are issued in two hectare lots. So when we bought <coughs> um, several thousand acres of this, what we call the orangutan legacy forest, the uh, the stack of land documents, and I'm not joking. I kept them on the floor, and they're about this high. <laughs> it, was about, it was several thousand hectares. Now, I mentioned that the main relationship that orangutans have with the world is through the forest. They're solitary. They have relationships with each other. Uh, they breed very slowly. They reproduce very slowly. And mainly what they do is they move through the forest at a very slow pace, up in the canopy, you know, letting the sun fall on their faces, and eating the sweet, succulent, mature fruit, ripe fruit, that is their mainstay. <clears throat> but the, and this fruit is found in the forest, in the tropical rainforest. And we know many of the domestic versions, the cultivated versions of these fruit, Mangoes, rambutan, um, 
star fruit. What other fruits come from the tropical rainforest? There's many of them. Uh, but mangoes and rambutans are my favorites, just like they are with the orangutans. Um, and so this is what orangutans eat. But what is happening to the forest? Well, something dreadful. And the other thing that I'd like to mention about our connection with the forest, human connection with the forest, is that we humans need the forest also, but we're not aware of it. But people complain about modern life. They complain about being stressed. They complain about being overwhelmed. They complain about being bloated. <laughs> they complain about you know, bad complexions. They complain about all kinds of things. And yet, why is this? Well, it's because they have lost their connection to nature. And if you live in the middle of a big city, um, it's very easy to do so. Um, I've noticed that this city, we're in Palo Alto, right? Or Mountain View? Palo Alto, right? Mountain View, Mountain View okay. <laughs> I don't know where the boundary lies. <laughs> um, but it's very well uh, wooded. It has a lot of foliage, a lot of plants. And I mentioned the fact that I thought local people here were very pleasant. I mean, one man just in this building held my door, the door open for me. Oh, it wasn't this building, it was the hotel. Um, <coughs> held the door open for me as I was coming and then as I was going because I was trying to find the lobby. You know, I mean, it's very pleasant. Uh, and maybe that's why. Maybe it's because people here have access to nature in a way that they may not in the middle of New York. So what are the benefits of being in nature? Well, there's been research that suggests that the benefits of being in nature include such things as improving short-term memory, uh, releasing uh, stress, so on and so forth, even reducing inflammation. And there was a study that I read, I think it was in Science, actually, in the journal Science, a number of years ago, that indicated that surgery patients with a view of nature, like if they, it wasn't, they didn't even need a, a window. If they had a painting with trees or foliage or flowers, an image of nature on their walls, that they recovered on an average one day faster than those without a view of nature. Then I read another study that that was interesting, and it was about children who had windows in their schools, elementary schools, as opposed to didn't, and there was a small but significant difference in their test-taking ability. It was a little complicated, but still, in the end, it was a significant difference that children who had windows that opened up to nature, opened up to foliage and trees, did better in the afternoon, not the morning, but in the afternoon um, than children who didn't. So um, the Japanese have a custom that is called Shinrin-yoku. And it literally means forest bathing. They go into the forest, they go into the woods, and they literally soak in the smells, and the sounds, and the sights of nature. And they do this on purpose to reestablish their connection with nature. So we humans need nature too. And what is happening to nature? Well, what's happening is we have global deforestation, massive deforestation. Half of the world's forests have been cleared. And some of this deforestation is related to climate change and global warming. And this is just a graph of, we call it a graph, an illustration of how those temperatures have changed over the years. And it's quite amazing, and it's quite impactful, and it's quite frightening. And the other thing is that People seem to know about the, um, about the massive fires that destroyed 
so many forests and orangutan populations in Borneo last year, 2015. But in reality, what happened in Borneo, which was very, which was absolutely terrible, was just illustrative of what was happening in the entire world. Uh, when I found this diagram, uh, it amazed me. I mean, who knew that there were so many hot spots in places like the Amazon, and Australia, and South Africa, Southern Africa. And the problem is that this world on fire is destroying the connections that we have with forests. And what we are doing to forests is destroying the connections that trees have with each other. I don't know if you're aware of the work of several people, including a woman in Canada, and I think it's a man in Germany, and they have demonstrated that trees talk to each other, and that large trees, the ancient sentinels of the, of the forest, actually send out carbon through their roots to their seedlings, to their related seedlings. So it's like those invisible networks I talked about with orangutans. We don't see them because orangutans virtually never meet, but they exist. But an orangutan female in the wild may only meet her daughter, her adult daughter, once in 10 years. I mean, I've been following orangutans for decades, and uh, they just simply don't meet. But yet, when they do meet, I'll give you an example. I remember an adult female and her adult daughter, they met, their eyes locked for maybe 10 seconds, and then they held hands. They held hands for 30 seconds, and then they dropped the hands. And then they went on and did their usual solitary things. And if you hadn't seen them for that 30 seconds, you would never have known and never have guessed that a deep relationship existed between this adult female and her adult daughter. So it's invisible. These networks are invisible. And those networks underground, underneath forests, are also invisible to the human eye. But they do exist. And they probably have profound consequences for humans as well. So OFI's orangutan legacy forest, one third of it was lost to the 2015 fires. And uh, this is also the case for our national park, and I say our because we've worked there for many years. It lost 120,000 hectares last year. And this is a park that it's 400,000 hectares, but part of it is actually in the, in the sea. So not all of it really exists as forest or as land-based ecology. So one of the things that we are doing, and this is not the main thing that we do, is we are planning to replant 2.9 million seedlings over the next 10 years. And the reason we're doing this is to help restore the areas of the orangutan legacy forest that fire destroyed last year. So this is our foundation, the Orangutan Foundation International. I'd like to go over some of the things that we do. We take care of orangutans, we rescue wild orangutans. We take care of orphans. We have 320 orphans right now under our care, all of whom we hope can be released to the wild, like he was. He wasn't happy with his release. No, he, this is very, very unusual. I don't want anybody to think that this is usual, uh, but he does glare at us. <laughs> like the easy source of food is now gone. We also help protect, uh, we work with the Indonesian government and the Indonesian Forestry Department, uh, Tanjung Puting National Park, which holds 
the largest wild orangutan population in existence. And you may ask, what is the largest wild orangutan population consist of? 6,000 individuals, that's all. And as I mentioned, we buy land, and it's not enough just to buy it. You have to protect it. You have to put guard posts. You have to patrol it. Uh, and that magnificent tree that just soars into the sky like a giant holding up the sky uh, is in the orangutan legacy forest. We didn't know it was there when we bought it. But it's like one of the biggest trees I've seen in that part of Borneo. And if you want local people to support conservation efforts, if you want local people to care about orangutans, there has to be something in it for them. In addition to just the efforts of conservation that, that, that local people are also beginning to understand and acquire. So we have very much supported and built up an ecotourism in Tanjung Puting National Park. And uh, when I first came there many years ago, not one single tourist came to Tanjung Puting. It wasn't until about 10, 20 years later, uh, after National Geographic articles appeared, after television programs appeared, that people started you know, coming to Tanjung Puting. And now Tanjung Puting National Park is the number one tourist object for international tourists in the entire province of central Indonesian Borneo. We get 15,000 tourists a year. Now, you know, that may seem like nothing. But for a relatively isolated, relatively inaccessible province in the, in the center, coastal center of Borneo, that's quite a lot. And we educate and we train. We work with uh, palm oil companies to train their managers and their workers not to kill orangutans, not to kill endangered wildlife. And this is one of our assistants who is spreading the word to a local palm oil worker. Just an illustration, we do a lot of this. And how we do it, one of the ways we do it, is we publish um, a newsletter that has very good, high production values. In fact, it costs us over a dollar uh, to produce and to print. But people keep it. They don't throw it away. And we spend a lot of time putting the message in. People read it. We ask questions. And we also have volunteer programs, like the one that Tracy, Tracy, sorry, uh, Victoria and her husband were on. And we do research. Camp Linky is where we do the research. We've been doing the research for 45 years. Um, we have a greater and deeper understanding of the factors that influence and impact orangutan adaptation and orangutan behavior. And unfortunately, those massive fires and global climate change that is occurring, if you are in Borneo, there's no question about it. It's getting hotter, getting much hotter than it was. Um, having or having a very negative impact on the orangutans because the fruit seasons have been disrupted. The orangutans are starving to death. These are wild orangutans. Not only because the forests are being burned, the forests are being destroyed by human activity directly, but also because the fruits are no longer fruiting. So orangutans are eating bark. They're eating young leaves. They're eating termites, which is OK, because they always eat some of those. Well, not the bark. Uh, in addition to the fruit, but the fruit is gone. And so what you're getting is you're getting wild orangutans literally starving. Similar to the phenomena that you see with polar bears who can no longer hunt on the ice like they used to.
And as you saw in the film, rescue, rehabilitation, and release of orangutans is a major part of what we do, but not all of what we do. And we have caregivers. We employ over 210 local people, which means that we probably support about 1,000 people locally. Most of them are Aboriginal. Most of them are Dayak people, who are the Aboriginal people of Borneo, although they no longer wear feathers and loincloths like they used to. But they still have their tattoos occasionally. And they still have their songs and their dances. So the caregivers uh, become surrogate mothers. And most of them are women uh, for the infant orangutans as they grow up. But the good thing about orangutans is in the process of growing up in the wild, the process is one of dissolution, of, of uh, d dissolving connections. You know, when the orangutan juvenile or adolescent leaves his mother, uh, or her mother, uh, the connections sort of dissolve, and those individuals become increasingly solitary until the male gets flangy, the cheek pads when he becomes totally solitary, except when he consorts with females. And the female uh, seems to give up her adolescent friendships with other females. We're all to caregivers in Borneo. And we release orangutans. Over the years, we've released about 450 orangutans back to life in the wild. And it doesn't depend on the orangutans so much. It depends on the quality of forests that we release them into as to whether they live well or don't live that well and come back to the feeding stations. Well, how can people help? The best way is to kick palm oil out of your life. You see palm oil on an ingredient in something that you're buying in the store? Please put it down. That's what I do. In fact, when I initially gave up palm oil, um, I lost five pounds. <laughs> it's interesting. It wasn't, it seemed that my health improved a little bit. And please stay in touch with us. Become a foster parent. You can't take the orangutan infant home with you, but <laughs> you can parent him or her long distance, and you can visit him or her when you go to Borneo, or you can volunteer in Borneo, as these people are doing. This is one of our construction teams. But the most important thing that you can do, aside from uh, giving up palm oil and letting other people know about what palm oil is doing, not just to the orangutans, but also increasingly uh, to the animals and the ecology of Africa and the Amazon, is visiting. You know, if there's something that you can do that's easy and fun, it's to visit. I mean, I urge you, go see the gorillas, go see the chimpanzees, go see the bonobos. And of course, most of all, go see the orangutans. Because when you come to areas where these animals live, you demonstrate to the local people their importance and significance to you as a, you know, influential foreigner. And also, you uh, demonstrate it with your dollars by buying souvenirs, by staying there, by buying food, paying guides. It's the most important thing that people can do, aside from avoiding palm oil. There is no real sustainable palm oil. They talk about it, and maybe we're just on the edge of getting it, but not yet, not yet. And I'd like to uh, close with a story. You know, I have all kinds of stories. And I think what I'd like to tell you is about an experience that I had many years ago and you know it was many years ago because it was when Al Gore was still president, a uh, vice president. He never became president, obviously. Uh, vice president. And I was invited uh, to a film studio in Los Angeles uh, because Los Angeles is 
uh, where I went to school, UCLA. It's the base of our foundation, our mothership, and that's where my parents lived while they were still alive. So uh, I have connections there. And uh, Al Gore was a speaker, and he had come in that day, and and he had a lot of activities, a lot of events. So by the time he came to the studio where this event was being held, uh, there were maybe 500 people there. It was quite late, and dinner had been served. And there was kind of that buzz in the room where everybody's really basically ready to go home. Uh, people were clinking their uh, teaspoons against you know, China mugs or teacups. Um, you know, there was just sort of that, I'm going to describe it, that air in the room that everything was soon going to evaporate and everybody would soon leave. So he started speaking. And of course, I'm an academic, so I carry pen and paper with me, virtually all the time. <laughs> and so I took out my little pad, my little book, and I'm waiting for Al Gore to say something significant. And this was many years ago. So he did not speak about global warming or global climate change, but he spoke about the pollution of the world's oceans. He spoke about the ozone layer. Um, he spoke about uh, coming animal extinctions. He spoke about a, um, whole systems of ecology disappearing. And you know, I'd heard it all before. It was very interesting, but I'd heard it all before. And then he said something that stuck with me. And what he said was this. He said, the conservation crisis is a spiritual one. And if we look, we think about, or I think about the things that I've been speaking here, standing here before you, what is it really all about? I mean, why are the forests disappearing? Why are orangutans going extinct? Why are gorillas and chimpanzees and bonobos, especially bonobos, in trouble? It has to do with the way that our civilization has progressed. Um, so the superficialities and the materialism uh, that we have, that so that when we go what am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is that our connection with nature has been lost. And because our connection with nature has been lost, um, we don't see with our eyes wide open what is happening in the world. And uh, a few years ago, I remember being shocked by the fact that the Kardashian sisters, <laughs> this is a few years ago, I don't know how they're doing now, uh, maybe better, had, um, um, had an income, combined income of about $65 million. And I thought about that. What do they spend it on? Hermes purses? I mean, imagine the good that $65 million could do for great ape conservation. And so when you picture people like that, and I'm sure they're pleasant women. I mean, there's, you know, I watched one of their shows once. <laughs> and it's clear that Kim Kardashian is a, you know, sweet, sensitive woman, right? But at the same time, how often does she stand underneath a tree and gaze up into the canopy and wonder where she came from? Anyways, I leave you with that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you all so much, and thank you, Dr. Galdikas, for joining us today and on the live stream. Um, if you would like to support the Orangutan Foundation and change the fate of the orangutans, I set up a donation link through our LinkedIn Gives platform. It is at bit.ly slash li orangutans. Please feel free to share that link with your networks and um, help us change the fate of the orangutans and the jungles of Indonesia. Um, 
just want to say thank you again for joining us. I hope um, after Dr. Galdicus's talk and seeing the documentary, we're all starting to understand how important our relationship is, not just with the animals, but um, the jungle and nature. And um, it's what we do today that will make the biggest impact tomorrow. So you don't need to go to Borneo. You don't need to hang out with monkeys. You don't need to spearhead conservation to make a difference. Small steps like knowing what ingredients you're buying at the grocery store, following a nonprofit on Twitter, um, you staying at eco-friendly lodges. All of these are small steps toward an even greater collective impact on the world. So thank you again for joining us and I hope you enjoyed International Orangutan Day. And if any of you have questions or would like to come up and talk to Dr. Galdicus, we're here and i um, happy to speak with you. And if you have any last minute things you have questions about, we will be right here and uh, hanging out for a couple minutes.